Continue. This chapter is called Chapter 6, Organizational Design and Structure. What's an organizational design? All right. Design, we started this at the very beginning about structure, how you structure the business. And this chapter will give you six key elements of organizational design. Next one, we identify contingency factors. If you remember, I already spoke previous lecture about contingency factors like uncertainty, like competition, and other things. So we're going to define, uh, uh, sorry, identify contingency factors related to organizational structure. Then we're going to compare and contrast traditional and contemporary organizational designs. And finally, discuss some of the challenges of business today. Uh, for this lecture, I'll probably cover only the first one, maybe a little bit of the second one, because it's a fairly long chapter. So, six elements of organizational design. That's section number one. And these elements are work specialization. I'll be explaining each of these in detail. Work specialization means you teach cooking, you teach bartending, you teach management, and somebody else teaches finance. But specialization means that a person will do a narrow type of work. So it's a narrow type of work and will become very skilled and efficient at it. So specialization is based on the fundamental concept of division of labor. In a division of labor, you have some group of people who are administrators, other people are in accounting, other people are teachers, other people clean the rooms over here, and other people take care of technology and IT. Second concept is, and the second key is, departmentalization. Everything is in departments. And that's exactly how universities work, but for any particular business. You got a sales department, you got a finance department, you got an accounting department, you got a production department, okay? So for each particular major task or major function, you got a separate department. So modern businesses are based on specializations. They are organized into departments, okay? And business is, management is based on authority. There is someone who's a boss, and there's someone below the boss. And usually, everybody has a boss except for the big boss, the CEO. And even the CEO is not completely irresponsible. He has to answer the board of directors, which is chosen from the owners or the shareholders of the company. So you have responsibilities. Everyone that works is usually responsible to somebody. All right. The next concept is span of control. And span of control simply means how many employees work underneath you. So a manager can have only three people working for him or could have 20 people working for him. Some organizations are highly centralized and some are decentralized. Centralization refers to the level at which decisions are made. And the last piece is formalization. Is everything written? Is everything formalized? Is everything, you know, I'm going to be discussing these in 
this particular lecture. So, number one, work specialization. How narrow is the work of every person? Back in the old days, could it tell you, just separate from the iPad, okay? It's about time, you've been playing way, no, separate, separate, just close it and put it on the next chair so I can see it, okay? You had enough, right? Right? Yeah, no, just close it, move it to the next chair. Okay, that's nice. Uh, if you don't have to be, you can, you know, if you like, you can stay, okay? But I mean, just playing like that, right? No good, right? You got company. <laughs> All right, so specialization is you don't want people's work to be too broad, like doing 10 or 20 different things. Because if you're doing 20 different things, you're doing a little bit of production, a little bit of accounting, a little bit of finance, a little bit of marketing, a little bit of advertising. If you do a little bit of a lot of things, you can't learn your job well. What you need is relatively narrow specialty. And the narrow specialty is accounting. Focus on accounting, you stay in accounting. Now, when you have an accounting department, you may have 15 people in the accounting department. Here at this university, you have easily 25 people in the accounting department. You will have one employee specializing on payroll. And payroll is the responsibility to pay salaries to employees. So one person is doing only salaries and nothing else. There will be another person doing only purchasing. So as the university is buying books, as it's buying computers, as it's buying this and it's buying that, there's one person who is responsible only for the purchasing part. A third person in accounting will be responsible for all payments except salaries. Someone will be doing payments for electricity, payments for internet, payment for this, payment for water, payment for whatever the university is making payments. You may actually have one person in the purchasing uh, uh, who will be responsible for the purchasing, let's say, of equipment, and another person who will be recording it. So you have two people recording. One people recording the equipment part and one people recording the payment part, okay? So, in an accounting department you may have 20 people and each of them specializing in one very, very narrow field, okay? That's called a narrow specialization or it could be a broad specialization. So, as you narrow more and more, people get more and more and more efficient. They can do more and more. They have the example of the widgets in division of labor back in the old days, where you can get uh, one person to make only 20 pins, you know, or needles, where pins. But if you get 20 people, you can get, let's say, 20,000 needles a day. Each one doing, one person doing cutting, cutting, cutting. Another one doing twisting, twisting, twisting. Uh, you've seen probably the Charlie Chaplin movie where you have the assembly line, you have 20 people, and the only thing the guy is doing is this with his hands. He's got the two uh, wrenches, he tightens, and then he goes to the next one, he tightens. So that's the type of specialization. It's an extremely narrow <laughs> specialization. And the more you specialize, the more productivity increase. So here we got work specialization, more specialization here, this is high specialization, this is low, and here you have productivity, low productivity, high productivity. So low specialization is usually associated with low productivity. As specialization increases, so does productivity. But specialization increases productivity up to a certain point. From a certain point on, you can even, you can even increase further specialization. Productivity does not 
necessarily increase. So it's important to understand that specialization is beneficial, but it is beneficial only to a certain point. Beyond a certain point, it's not any more efficient. Beyond that point, you get what's called diseconomies from specialization. It's called impact from human diseconomies. When a person does a very narrow job, they are not very happy with it. And when they're not very happy with it, they usually get distracted and or they get tired. They just don't like the job a lot. People like to have some variety in their job. So sometimes professors will have a favorite subject, but every semester they like to change one subject a little bit because the job is getting too boring. Okay? High specialization makes anyone's job boring. Okay? If you're a cook, you can specialize, let's say, in Chinese food. But sometimes it's nice to cook some other foods. Otherwise, you get too bored too quickly. So that's on specialization. Modern business is based on specialization and division of labor. That's number one. Number two is departmentalization. Everything in modern business, in modern, we call it organizations, including government is based into departments. These are a particular unit inside the organization which has similar responsibilities. This is a little bit more complicated. You have five different ways that you can divide departments. You can divide departments by function. And by function means that you're going to have a separate finance department. You're going to have a separate accounting department. You're going to have a separate production department. Sometimes it's called manufacturing department. You're going to have a separate sales department. Separate purchasing department. So you have the division based on the different functions. So, based on the work performed, again, engineering, accounting, yes, you will usually have even separate IT department, okay, human resources. So, that's the function. Sometimes it is based on product. When it's based on product, you focus a manager responsible for a particular product. For example, you have in Apple, you have certain departmentalization based on product. You're responsible for iPads so that students can play with them during lectures, right? You're responsible for iPhones so that other students sitting right on the back play with them during class, right? Uh, someone else is going to be responsible for the MacBook, which is going to be extremely lightweight. The MacBook Air is supposedly, until recently, the lightest and the thinnest, the skinniest computer laptop on the market, until recently, uh, which provides little weight for the business person who can carry it for eight hours on his shoulder, who can carry it around, and it's not very tiresome, okay? So, then you're gonna have a separate one for the uh, iMac, which is the computer. You will probably also have a separate one for the monitor, for the monitor. Someone who specializes on the uh, Apple monitors. They <coughs> like to think that the monitors are the best in the world with the highest possible quality. At least back in the old days, their monitors were also the biggest. They offered much bigger and five times more expensive monitors. But if you did graphics design or engineering or architecture, you have to use Apple because Apple was the best. Same was also with their processor. Apple also had 
and produced its processor, the chip inside running the computer, which they highly, again, specialized. It was good for graphics design, for movies and stuff like that. But over time, Intel caught up with them and they decided they're not going to use their own chip. They're not going to manufacture it. The point is, management is based entirely on product. They give example about Nike, and you got men's footwear, meaning men's running shoes and shoes in general. Women's footwear means, meaning women's shoes. They have apparel, like clothes, running uh, you know, uh, shirts and stuff like that. So you focus the particular manager on a particular product, and you make them responsible for it. Uh, here, in the university, the product is education based on, uh, let's say, specialization. So, we have inside the department, uh, sorry, the, the faculty, person ordering textbooks. In another faculty, you got another person focusing on uh, or, or ordering textbooks. We got here, one person IT, you got another person IT. But in general, we focus on hospitality and tourism. Over there, they focus on international studies. So the specialization here in management, again, is based on the type of course or the type of education, essentially the educational product. Educational product being engineering or hospitality, completely different product. So universities are based on the type of the educational product. Uh, sometimes the educational product in the university will be a bachelor's degree and then a master's degree. When I was studying at the Ohio State University, you got the undergraduate school and I was in the graduate school. And graduate school specializes in master's and doctorate degree. An undergraduate school specializes in bachelor's degree. Sometimes, it will be based on customers. So the whole departments will be based on different customers. And you see these are a good group of employees based on customers' problems. In a sense, graduate and undergraduate division is based on the product. But in another sense, graduate and undergraduate division is based on a customer. Undergraduates have completely different needs and all the other things from graduates. Graduates are a lot fewer, they are much more narrowly specialized, and so on. So sometimes you have a very high customer specialization. You will have a wholesale department, you will separately have a retail department, you will have a separate sales to the government department. Now, you can have a mixed structure, which I'll explain now here. When I was working at, at Sterling Commerce, Sterling Commerce was a software company of about 3,000 people. In 3,000 people, there was about accounting department, which was well over 100 people, 100 people in the accounting department. I was a sales analyst and the sales department had 200 people. You had the software division, which was the engineering part, they wrote the software, were another 200 people. You had separately a tiny, tiny little marketing department, okay? So you got department based on function. Now, inside the sales department, we are designed by customers. So, sales department of 200 people, you will have what's called big corporate accounts. And you're gonna have a certain number of people, like 30 salespeople focused on big corporate accounts. One salesperson will be servicing only five corporations. Another salesperson will be servicing only five corporations. Another salesperson will be servicing only five corporations. 
So you may have the whole organization, meaning the whole corporation designed by function, but inside the sales department, you are separated by customer. So the sales department will have separate one only for government customers. A small department of 30 salespeople working with different government institutions to sell the software. There was another one called small business sales. And small business sales will have 60 people in it who will be selling only to small businesses. And there was another department called mid-sized businesses. So we're going to have a department for big enterprises, a separate sales subs department within the sales for middle size, for small size, for government. So you can have a mixture within an organization. Again, it's a big three. Next one, you're going to be based on geographic. And in our corporation, we have a sub-level. If you have, let's say, 50 people working for small businesses, so 50 people working, selling to small businesses, they will be divided geographically. One person covering the state of Ohio, another person covering the state of Michigan, another person covering the state of Illinois, three or four people covering the state of California. So you will have further structure where you have a huge sales department which is divided into four sub-departments and then for the small one you will have a geographic division where you cover this state, you cover this state, you cover this state, you cover this state. And you're going to have California, four people, they further subdivide California. We call these territories. That's how they're known in the sales department. They're known as territories, okay? For example, if you have a hotel here, and have three people doing marketing and advertising of your hotel to foreign countries, you will have one person focusing on advertising in North America, which will be the United States and Canada. You're going to have a separate person focusing on advertising in Europe, and you're going to have a third one advertising in Asia. So that's going to be geographic or territorial division. And the final one is based on process and groups of employees based on the work flow or customer flow. That's how are designed many government services. When I was when I was uh, last week getting my work permit here in Phuket Town, uh, we went with the administrator and they say go here and we sit down, we fill out the form, we sign the form. Then they say go to that desk. Everything's finished and you go with the ready paper, go to that desk, the employee did this and that, they filled out another form, they did a few other things. They say everything's great, now you go to Big Boss for approval. We go to Big Boss for approval, Big Boss is looking at all the documents, uh, says everything looks good, they sign, the Big Boss put a stamp on it, and then Big Boss says, now go to get your work permit issued. It's actually a document. So we go to a fourth place, where all they do is say, okay, everything signed, everything's okay, we got a Big Boss approval, we need just to issue, it's a nice tiny little booklet. And they say, boom, in five minutes, come and get back the booklet. Okay, five minutes, the book is ready, you put it in your pocket. So that's a simple flow process. Another type of a flow process is when you go and try to register a car. I don't know how it's here, but I did it two times in the Middle East. I've done it many times in Europe. I've done it a few times in the United States. They say, first, go here, uh, fill out the documents. Then go there, we need to see that you have paid insurance. Then go here, we need a car inspection. Then go here, we need a license plate. Then go there, we need to attach the license plate. Then go there for the inspector to see that everything's okay. And when the inspector signs, they give you 
car registration. And you got your car registration, and that's your legal document that you own that particular car with this kind of chassis and with that kind of engine serial number. So this is based on process. Not necessarily only government. It could be some other uh, businesses could be also divided and based on process. But that's, yeah, here's another one that I'm thinking that is based on processes. Hospitals actually have to go to the local hospital uh, to get a little vaccination over here. You see, I got a little vaccine. Uh, so they say, oh, go to the entrance and they say, okay, they look at it. Are you at the hospital? See, I'm registered at the hospital. Show us ID. I show them ID. They put me in the computer. They say, oh, you need a rabies vaccination. Okay. Uh, and the, the employee writes in the computer, gives my document to the nurse. The nurse says, okay, she goes to get the rabies vaccine. Uh, then they go send it to the payment department, to the cash register, then they say, okay, uh, wait for the room. When the room is empty, you go in there, they give you a rabies vaccine, okay? And then they say, go to the cash register, pay. When you pay, you can go home. So everything is based on the process. Hospitals, modern hospitals today are very usually focused on different processes, especially in the emergency when someone comes injured and you need very quick. So you got to have a very well detailed process and knowing who does what. So this is the departmentalization and it could be, now let me again, within the hospital, which is based on process, you still want to have a separate accounting department, 5, 10, 20, 30 people working in accounting department. You still want to have a separate department, let's say, procuring the medicine, buying the different types of pills from the different uh, pharmaceutical companies. So even within the hospital, you're going to have a separate department, which is like IT department. Usually, everyone in the hospital's got a computer, right? So when they have a computer and they got a hospital of 300 people, you're going to have 300 computers. You're going to have a little IT department, maybe four, maybe five people responsible for everybody else's computer. So you can have a structure on the one hand based on the process of serving the patient. You're going to have a separate structure which is based on accounting, on IT. Yeah, a hospital will have a human resources department, maybe two or three people doing everything related to salaries and to hiring and to qualifications and all the other things. So you will have oftentimes a mixture of these within. So at one level, you will probably have only one. But at the lower level, you're going to have a different type of departmentalization because you have different levels within the sales department, but I'm based on customer, and then at some level within job. Alright, so that was, if I remember, number two, right? Number one is work specialization. Number two is departmentalization. So they have five different departmentalizations. Number three is types of authority. And authority basically means that you have President responsive to the, we we'll call it Chief Executive Officer, known in English as CEO. CEO is the big boss. CEO, the big boss. They have a president. Now, you will also have Executive Vice President here. You can also have Executive Vice President. Now, you may have one little thing, the Chief Executive Officer will have one little thing called a Secretary. Now, secretary today is uh, considered really bad, okay? So they don't like to use the word secretary. They call them administrative assistant. Administrative assistant sounds a lot nicer. And they usually shorten it to the admin. They just call it, oh, go to the admin. So admin is usually used. 
instead of secretary in model business. Now, a lot of times the admin could be actually a man. Okay, it doesn't have to be necessarily a woman, right? Big boss, smart model, we're going to have two secretaries, right? For different things, or three, possibly, depending on how big the boss is. So, you're going to have a line of authority. Now, we have the president, and we see what happens. Vice president, vice president, vice president, vice president, vice president. So, for example, you're going to have president of the university, and then we have a vice president for different things, okay? Uh, fun time, right? So, you may have different vice president. You may have what's called vice president accounting. You're going to have vice president finance, okay? You're going to have vice president manufacturing. So, each major department will have its own vice president, okay? And then, here they use the word region. And region, in this particular case, region 1, region 2, region 3, will mean that the departmentalization is based on geography. So, you will have region 1, maybe east, the, the east coast. Region 2 will be west coast. Region 3 will be southern USA. Okay? So, you will have different regions. And you're going to see the vice president will be divided into, we call now these regional managers. Regional managers. And then within the region, you're going to have districts. Districts. District 1, District 2, or District A, District B, District C, District D. So, this is a, an example of what's called chain of command. Chain of command essentially means who reports to whom. The key word they use in business is to report to. To report to somebody means who, that he is your boss, that you are his, we call it subordinate. So, who are you reporting to? And I say, oh, I'm reporting to Jim King. Jim King was for many years my boss over there, but still. So I say, I'm reporting to Jim King, meaning Jim King is my boss, okay? So, chain of command basically tells you who reports to whom. One of the key ideas in management, and it should be coming fairly soon, that one person is usually responsible only to one manager. You don't have, you're not responsible to two managers the same time. You have only one boss. That's a fundamental concept in management, which I'll be discussing in modern days is not, is getting not so true. I'll be discussing this uh, next time. So, you got line authority versus staff authority, and we need to, you need to make difference between line and staff. Like authority is, in general, authority is the power to make decisions and the power to influence decisions. That's authority. Authority basically means that what you can tell other people what to do. Okay? Authority basically means the way you understand it, you're the boss, okay? And the rights that the boss usually has. So, you need to understand between line and staff. Line is, it means the main business. They call it the main line of business. And it's usually associated either with the customer or is associated with the main product. Staff means supporting supporting the main business, supporting the line. Staff in this particular case, it usually is accounting. So in all businesses which are not accounting businesses, for example in the university, the accounting department is staff. 
in a hotel, the accounting department is staff. Okay. Uh, in the hospital, the accounting department is staff. All right. So IT department is usually staff. IT department in university is staff. It's only helping other people's other people do their work. So staff are people who narrowly specialize into something, could be accounting, could be also purchasing department. This university will surely have a purchasing department which purchases for everybody keyboards, for all students iPads, right? So they're going to be buying 1,000 1, iPads. I mean, they're not just going to send somebody, it's going to be a purchasing department. The purchasing department will negotiate a, it's called a bulk price or a wholesale price so that the university will buy a little or maybe a lot cheaper. They say, hey, we're going to buy iPads, we want 1000 And instead of the regular price of 40000 Apple salesman will say, okay, we'll agree on 15 so you're going to get a wholesale discount, okay? So all of this is staff. And line will be us. Line will be professors. We are doing the main time of work. In the hospital, the line will be the doctor and many of the nurses. Many of the nurses who do actual work, like the nurse who's doing the injection okay that will be the main line of business but I have to go through the reception which is staff I have to go through the cash register which is also staff you also have another department which is like the pharmacy where they get the different whatever it is the materials so again you have here is executive director, and as I explained a little bit ago, you're going to have assistant to the executive director, which is usually called administrative assistant. And you see, you have a director of human resources, you got a director of operations, you got a director of purchasing, you got other directors. And then in operations, in a hospital, operations will be doctors. And you're going to have one, uh, let's say, type of operations will be child delivery. Okay? Another, op uh, another operation will be surgeries. Another one will be heart problems. Another one will be lung problems. So doctors will specialize according to their field. And you're going to have different departments within the hospital. And then you have, again, within the unit manager, you may have purchasing of their own, you may have their own operations, you may have their own human resources and other. The idea is that the line shows you who you are responsible to, who you are reporting to. Okay, this shows you a line of responsibility or reporting. Let me see what else we have here. We've got three more. And I just explained a little bit ago the concept of unity of command. Unity of command is a structure in which each employee reports to, and here's the word, reports to, meaning is subordinate to, reports to only one manager. In other words, everyone has only one boss. Okay? You don't have two bosses, because if you have two bosses, one boss wants from you, you do this A, B, and C, the other one says, oh, you got to do E, G, and F, and you wonder, should I do this, or should I do that? Should I make this boss happy, or should I make that boss happy? Okay? So, usually, there are lots of conflicts associated with employees that have two or three bosses. That's why that's typically avoided yet only one boss. Alright, it's important to understand when we say boss, it means basically authority and power. 
When we say boss, we mean authority. Power is very, very different. And I will explain in a moment. So authority is the right. You are actually the boss. It actually can tell your subordinates what to do. It is a right and it's based on authority's figure or it's the position in the organization. So, for example, we got a department chair and the department chair has authority of all professors inside the department because the department chair is the boss. Now, power is something very different. It means an individual capacity to influence decision. So someone may have a very low position, but it could be, we call it influential. It could influence. Sometimes someone, and they give an example, if, if someone, they give an example has 20 years of experience in particular operation, and that particular person is extremely valuable, and he could easily go to the big boss, to the chief executive, tell, hey boss, we gotta do this and this, if we're trying to do this and this, it's no good because of whatever the problems are, okay? So, someone may have a very, very low position, and yet be extremely influential. Usually their influence comes, and that's coming a little later, because they're really good experts. Sometimes they may be influential because it's the boss's daughter, okay? She may have a very low position, but she is influential, all right? She can talk to big boss because she goes tonight home. That's his her daddy, okay? So they go home tonight and she, hey, daddy, can this and that and whatnot. So she can influence decisions by being a good friend to the big boss or being a relative to the big boss, being the daughter or the niece of a big boss, okay? So someone may have, that's very important to understand, a very, very, very low position and yet be very influential. So influential are usually people with a very, very, very long experience in the company. Someone who's worked for 20 or 25 years, they know everything about the business. They're extremely influential. A lot of times, a lot of the big bosses, they just go to that person, we call it experienced person. They go to him because of his experience to consult with him. All right? Sometimes a lot of power have the admin assistant. She's just a secretary, maybe only 25 year old secretary, okay? With little education and no practical authority. Yet, she could be very powerful because she can send particular documents to the boss. She'll decide what to print out and the boss to see. She will decide when you want to go and see the boss. Oh, no, no, boss is busy. You cannot go and see him come tomorrow, okay? So she can effectively block the access to the boss or she can block the information to the boss and that means a lot of power. So there's a big difference between authority and power. Let's see what else we got. All right. Here it is, Chief Executive Officer. This is the little graph over here. This piece here is demonstrated, it's called the core of power, or the power core. This is where the power is, and this is where the decisions are. One thing is sure, if you're higher up the level, so this is the low level management, this you can think of the middle level management, this you can think of the top level management, Top level management is close to the core of power. These are very powerful people. Then, at the middle level, level management, some will be far from the power and some will be to the very core. You can have someone at the very low level who could be close to the core of power and someone who's far away. So, usually the higher you are, the closer you will be to the core of power. 
But they may be people who have a very low position and are still very close to the. For example, when I was working uh, at the software company, I was only a technical analyst and systems analyst, but I provided all the reporting for the vice president of sales. So vice president of sales know that I'm the reporting man. He's going to call me or send me a message or send his secretary and say, hey, can you give me this or can you give me that? And I'll be going to the big boss quite often. I'll be working directly for the big boss. So he says, hey, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. And I can usually tell the boss, hey boss, I'm seeing the sales of this product not going well, I'm seeing this or I'm seeing that or whatever the analysis of data is. So I be relatively close to the vice president of sales, okay? And if I'm doing a great job for the vice president of sales, which is the big boss, my little boss doesn't really matter if he likes me or doesn't like me. Because I already have a good connection with the big boss. I'm working most of the time for the big boss. And they say, oh yeah, he's doing big boss, he's reporting. So my manager is asking me, just tell me what you did for the big boss. I say, well, I did this report, this report, this report, this report. Separately, I did report for the regional managers, seven regional managers, seven different reports. I did this, 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 and this. So he doesn't bother me much because I just tell him, okay, I'm doing this, 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 this. Uh, every Monday we have, when we have a meeting, uh, uh, on the meeting he just asked me, tell me which projects you're working on. Tell me what you're working on. And I tell him, I work on this, 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 and this. This is my list of current projects. And then he says, okay, he doesn't give me any more new things, he doesn't ask me anything, uh, I know what I'm supposed to do, I know what I'm supposed to do it, so I don't have much communication. I, mean, I tell him what I'm doing, but I don't have very many things. Same thing here, when I'm teaching these courses, I have very little communication with my boss because there's not much to discuss. The, when I came, you know, I was told, you're going to be teaching accounting, you're teaching management, all right? So I'm teaching accounting, teaching management, I ask, well, where was my schedule? And they tell me, your schedule is management group one on Tuesday and Wednesday, and this time and this time, and this classroom and this classroom. I ask, is there a textbook already, or do I choose the textbook? And they say, yes, you have a textbook. This is your textbook. I can't choose it. It's already chosen for me. It's already ordered, okay? It's available. So I said, okay, I'll take this textbook. And then I asked, well, what about accounting? I says, well, we don't have accounting textbook. You choose textbook and we're going to order. So basically, we arrange the course. And from then, for the last four weeks, I don't have very many communication. The course goes, course goes on and everything's fine. Now they're asking me, the only thing they've asked me is, please prepare the midterm and submit it up front. And I submitted it up front, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. So, this is the example of power four, and some people may be very low level, but still close to the power. And we have one or two more. All right, sources of power, let me see how many more span of control, no, we've got too many. Next time, we continue, remind me from, this is slide number, 12, okay? Slide number 12, we continue next time, alright?